the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, my friend. How are you, Tyson? I am doing well. Got in the pool last night. It was cold outside, but warm in the pool, baby. So uh, it was good. What about you? Oh, we had a little bit of drama here at the office yesterday. I had to let a lawyer go. And it was uh, it was somebody who was well-liked, but they had done some things that we couldn't let them continue. And I was sad to see her go, but it was obviously the right decision. And now we're sort of dealing with getting the team uh, on board. Yeah, it's never a fun time. It's my least favorite thing of, of, of running a firm is, is letting someone go, but sometimes it's just necessary. And from what you talked about in the Guild, it was it was not excusable. So I can't blame you at all, but it just sucks you had to go through that. Well, let's go ahead and introduce our new friend, Tom Case. He's a civil rights lawyer up in Chicago. He helps people that are in detention or jail who are abused, and he also represents people in the gig economy, which is pretty exciting. And we're glad to have them on the show. Tom, thanks for being with us, man. No, thanks. Thanks for doing this, guys. I have probably listened to all or nearly all of the episodes. So, you know, appreciate what you guys are doing. You know, that's the best kind of listener is what I hear is that the ones that listen to every episode. So, mm-hmm. so I, I think that's about high, highly bingeable. Yourself. Yeah. So let's talk about your journey a little bit. Tell us about how you got to where you are now and where you started. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot of intentionality to it until recently. You know, I graduated college with kind of a, not a useless degree, but a degree that doesn't point you in a direction. And uh, I just went to these uh, kind of on-campus interviews and this kind of, this guy came in who had like a a husband and wife, fair housing plaintiff's firm up in the mountains of Northern California. And I just liked the guy. I didn't know anything about fair housing or, or law really. You know, I had a bunch of people tell me I should go to law school because I didn't have anything else to do. But I went and worked for this guy. I really liked and, and still keep in touch with with him and, and the other lawyers there and, and the family. You know, it's like kind of a my mentor, second father figure. Um, and I spent three years there, learned a lot about fair housing law and, and plaintiff's work and kind of how that small business was run. Felt kind of comfortable going to law school after that. Went to law school, did okay, you know, did did some clerking but got kind of clerkships at weird times. So I had these weird four and five month periods between them to do. So I, I spent the first one at a well-known consumer class action shop on the plaintiff side here in town or in Chicago. I spent the second one at, at a really well regarded kind of civil rights firm that mostly does uh, wrongful conviction work here in the city. So, you know, yeah, I got a kind of, by the time I was ready to make the first, like what law firm am I going to work at? to start my career choice after the second clerkship, I worked at a tiny plaintiff side fair housing firm, plaintiff side consumer class action firm, and a plaintiff side traditional civil rights, you know, 1983 firm. And uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I went back to the, to the fair housing firm and said, hey, can I open a Chicago office? And, you know, we did that. And it was actually, it was working pretty well. We had some good, good relationships with referral sources in Chicago and Indiana. But um, then I got married and, and we got pregnant. And I don't know if you've ever taken any fair housing cases, but it's not a, you're not going to be buying any yachts. 
And, you know, my wife was a lawyer, you know, two, two folks worth of, uh, you know, nice law school debt. And, you know, she wasn't sure what she wanted to do after we had a kid. So I panicked. And then I went to one of the big, big law defense firms here in town that, you know, they, they'll, if you got a couple of clerkships and a GPA and you're not too old, they'll, they'll kind of take you. And, you know, I went there and I, I basically wrote motions to dismiss securities and consumer class actions for about two years, you know, which, which is fine. I mean, talk about, you know, you got six kinds of coffee machines, you know, you've got people waiting to help you on a moment. Like there are people whose only job it is to help you find the right people at the firm to help you. Like I, I remember that I needed like a video edited for a pro bono case. And there was a guy in New Yorkers who did that or like data mined out of a 2 million, you know, row spreadsheet. And there's a guy in, who in the New York office in the bowels of some office building who's like the master of Excel. So it was kind of a nice experience to practice that way. But, you know, I can kind of tell pretty close. These kind of were nice people, but they weren't my people. You know, it's a nice place to work, but not, not my thing. And then out of the blue, I get this recruiter call. And I, I remember exactly what she said. She said, there are these three guys who just sold a litigation finance hedge fund for about $200 million. And they're starting a plaintiff's firm. I think you fit the mold of what they're looking for. And this was a shop, Keller Lankner. And I think they'd been around for about maybe a month or two when I got that call. And I started talking to them. And you know, it seemed like an interesting idea. Like imagine a plaintiff's firm that has a bankroll the size of like a Fortune 500 company and kind of the damage you can do. And I met with the guys and, you know, it just seemed kind of too interesting. And the, it, you know, the pay was, was right for the needs with the family. And so I went there and I think I became the second, I can't remember if I was the second or third non founding lawyer and employee at, at Keller. And, you know, we had, we had some cool stuff. So this guy, Warren Postman, who came to Keller about the same time I did, he was friends with these guys. So two of the three founding partners clerked together on the Supreme Court with Warren. So, like in this crew, I was I was really the dumb one after graduating, like in the top five of a law school and clerking twice. Like I was very much the dumb one. And Warren had this idea that, you know, all these companies have arbitration clauses, mandatory arbitration clauses, and class action waivers. And he took that knowledge combined with what he saw in the mass tort space of kind of mass client acquisition. And he said, Well, what if you what if you go to an Uber or a Lyft? or a DoorDash, and you start running ads, and you sign up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 Uber drivers. And then you go to Uber, and you say, you know, on Monday, I'm going to file 50,000 arbitration demands with AAA. And then in a week, they're going to come to you with a bill for the filing fees of about $2,000 each. So in two weeks, you're going to owe $100 million. And, you know, that that strategy, uh, especially when you combine it with the fact that you can, you can move to compel as a plaintiff, right? So they go, well, I don't want to pay. You go to federal court and you give some poor district judge the opportunity to say, you know, look, Uber, you've been moving to compel people into arbitration for 10 years. Turnabout is fair play. Pay the damn fees. And, you know, that strategy was, uh, was pretty successful. I wouldn't say anything, but Keller did a, a press release after I left where they said, you know, in the first couple of years, we've made $200 million doing this. So it was pretty successful. But my part of it, which I really enjoyed was kind of the logistics part, because, you know, as, as you guys know, I think you both have pretty high volume practices. It takes some doing to keep track of a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand people. And it takes some doing to kind of integrate the flow of client intake information into a database in a way that lets you keep track of everything and not have your head explode. And so my, you know, my life was kind of building first by myself and then gradually glomming on, you know, employees and contractors and helpers uh, to keep the technology side and the kind of client personnel, client management side rocking and rolling as, as we built that ship. And, and eventually that turned into basically a call center where I think when I left, we had, I don't know, 40, 40, 50 full-time people. And so, I mean, it was just a really cool experience to kind of help grow that practice and that company. 
And, and frankly, the, one of the coolest parts was doing it with, you know, resources. Like now I, I have my own little firm. I do not have the bankroll of Fortune $500 company. And I really miss the days when it was just going on daddy's credit card, you know. But, you know, it was a wonderful experience. And I think, you know, those guys are going to continue to do pretty amazing stuff. But basically, once I'd been there two years, you know, things were starting to hit. I got my first kind of sizable payout. And, you know, I'd always, I'd always kind of wanted my own shop and to do my own stuff. And I think, you know, as cool as the stuff at Keller Leitner was, it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't my kind of passion. And, you know, the stuff I've always enjoyed the most is kind of the trial work and, and getting to know the individual clients. And when you have 300 and something thousand clients, you're not developing close relate, especially from my position as basically the ops guy, you know, you're not developing close relationships. So, you know, I decided to kind of take that money, say thanks. And, uh, you know, finally felt like I could, I had enough runway to, to start a plaintiff's contingency practice. And so I, you know, I split and I, I started my firm about two weeks before Chicago went into lockdown for the pandemic. And I've just, you know, been kind of slowly going at it. I think the goal is to focus exclusively on the cases I feel the most strongly about, which are the prisoners, civil rights cases, some of the police misconduct cases. And then I also do uh, sexual harassment and assault in the housing context. So landlords, housing providers that take advantage of tenants. And it'd be nice to build a, a really strong docket of, of kind of those cases. But in the meantime, you know, I need to make some money. So I still do uh, some wage theft in the gig economy cases. You know, they're very, they're very righteous cases and they're very uh, kind of straight on the law. So I do a bunch of those kind of keep, keep some cash flow coming in. And uh, I also do a little bit of consumer class action just based on the, the relationships I've made and, and kind of the skill set you develop in that area. But the hope is in, in another year or two, it's going to be the civil, mostly the civil rights trial work. So there's way, way longer than you probably wanted, but that's kind of the story of my life. No, that was great. And Tyson texted me, this is going to be an easy interview. <laughs> yeah. So lots of angles we could go here. I mean, part of me wants to talk about that fear that you had when the baby was coming to go work for the insurance defense firm, but we can, we can skip over that. What did you decide you wanted to have your firm be when you were deciding to leave Keller? What, what did you, how did you frame not so much like the practice areas, but like the lifestyle, what did you want to have? And, and I do, I, I'm sort of giggling to myself because Tyson and I have been talking a lot about planning and how everybody had all these plans. And I said to my, I've been saying to him and to others, you know, I bet there's some lawyer out there who had all the best plans in the world to start their firm around March 10th of 2020, you know, right before COVID went full bore. So talk a little bit about that if you could. Sure. So the plan was definitely both a, this is the kind of law I want to practice, but, but like you said, a, a huge part of it for me was this is the kind of life I want to have. And this is the kind of workspace I want to create. You know, I, I, I've worked in so many law firms and, you know, I, I kind of kind of seen what I like and what I don't like. And, you know, I don't like the hierarchical, you know, send me an email because my last email had a typo in it. Bullshit. You know, our, our lives are too short for that nonsense. And, you know, I think you can still have high standards and, and do good legal work if, uh, you know, if you hold people accountable with, with some grace uh, when they mess up. And so kind of creating a, a workplace and having, you know, the people who respect each other and, and act with a sense of calm and, and, uh, and dignity is a big part of it, was a huge part of it when I, when I split away and, you know, making sure people on the team feel valued. And right, you know, right now I don't have any W2 employees. I have, I think seven or eight independent contractor folks who give me about five or 10 hours a week, something like that, kind of all over the, the globe. And I have one 1099 lawyer who I'm hoping in another couple of months, she's, we're doing a six month kind of trial period and then I'm hoping she'll become a partner if she can still kind of stomach being near me. But no, the, the plan was very much, you know, too, too faceted. Like, you know, I don't, you know, at, at Keller, just the, the speed at which we were moving, you know, we were all working, you know, crazy, crazy hours, weekends, emergencies, 
you know, when, when you try to duct tape together a system that can handle that volume, it's a lot of duct tape and it breaks a lot. And so, you know, it's chaos. And I think, you know, some people love that. I don't like, I want, you know, I actually want to hang out with my family. I don't usually want to work late nights or weekends. And I think that in a high margin business, like plaintiff's contingency work, you know, maybe you're, you're giving up the marginal dollars a little bit if you're not willing to grind for years, seven days a week, 15 hours a day, but you can do fine. And I think at my shop, the priority is, is you know, people have in their lives too. The question. Tom, I'm going to list your, your practice areas again. Prisoner civil rights, police misconduct, gig economy wage theft, sexual harassment and housing, consumer slash privacy class actions. I'm going to set aside for a second the fact that those, those are several niches, but those are all practice areas that I feel like no one wants, right? So <laughs> I feel like, because they're, they're tough cases, almost all yeah. of them are tough cases. So I guess, how do you manage that? I mean, and I'm sure it's easy to get leads because you, you let people know what you do when it comes to those practice areas. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm giving you all those cases. Cause we, I mean, we, at our firm, we just hired a lawyer and he's, he's got a specialty in prisoner. We just call them rights cases, but there, a lot of them are prisoner rights cases and they're extremely difficult cases. I mean, I'd say all those cases, at least from my standpoint are really tough cases. So how do you manage that? Cause it doesn't seem like you've got like a cash cow in there anywhere. So how do you manage all those different practice areas? Sure. So, you know, the, the goal so is kind of two ways. One is I don't want to be managing them forever. And so the plan is to kind of, in, in order to not run out of cash, to do things I know how to do and, and understand very, very well. And that's really where the wage theft comes in. You know, they're, they're all arbitrations. And so under some of the arbitrators rules, the cases basically have to be done in six to eight months. So, you know, and I, I'm so familiar with these defendants and the facts that I can do it very efficiently. Like I have several hundred of those cases and I ain't working nights and weekends. So, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I can use, I, you know, I, I'm a big file vine proponent. I have, you know, 150 templates for that stuff. And, you know, I'm just more efficient than they are. So it's pretty, uh, that's that's kind of the answer on that. And then on the the really tough stuff, so the civil rights stuff, you know, that's some of the stuff that keeps me up at night. Because you're right, they're they're tough cases. Often they're very expensive. One another issue is the people who defend them and the people who write checks to settle them are very used to paying, you know, twenty five hundred bucks, five thousand bucks to settle these cases. Because most of the ones they're resolving are pro se, you know, prisoners representing themselves, right? So if you come in and you're like, I want a million and a half dollars because your guard put my guy in handcuffs, picked him up, dropped him on his face and stomped on him for 40 minutes, then they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, it doesn't even compute. And, you know, you're going, you're going to trial, you're going near trial in a lot of these. And then, you know, I'll be honest, you know, as, as a financial matter, that scares me a little because my hypothesis is if I pick the right cases and I work them hard. And I don't take crap money that the, the practice will work out and a couple really strong cases a year once I've got some momentum kind of carry the overhead of the firm. But that is an untested hypothesis, right? So I'm in, in the process of testing, kind of hoping that I'm not putting, you know, my nest egg and, and all my time into something that isn't ultimately going to work. As far as getting cases, you know, it's actually in Chicago, there's such a good, strong bar of people who have just been suing the cops and suing the prisons forever, that it's actually really hard to get good cases here. And, and frankly, most of my good cases are in places where, you know, no one does this work, which again, just is trading one set of, you know, it's trading problems on the back end for, you know, ease on the front end, you know, but yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, if I wanted to do kind of easy money law, I think there are other things I, I know how to do, but I think anybody who's worked a couple of the prisoners cases and seen some of the stuff these guys put up with, you know, it's, it's impactful. I'm sure, you know, just like the way insurance companies treat PI plaintiffs or the way the government treats people with righteous immigration claims, it just pisses, you know, some things just piss you off. And if you can make money kind of attacking the stuff that pisses you off, you know, why not? Running your own practice can be scary. Whether you're worried about where the next case will come from, 
feeling like you're losing control over your growing firm or frustrated from being out of touch with everyone working under your license, the stress can be overwhelming. We will show you how to turn that fear into a driving force of clarity, focus, stability, and confidence that eliminates the roller coaster of guilt-ridden second-guessing and mistake-making to get you off that hamster wheel for good. Maximum Lawyer in Minimum Time is a step-by-step playbook that shows you how to identify what your firm needs and how to proactively get it at every stage of the game so you are prepped and excited for the inevitable growth that will follow. Name the lifestyle that you want and we'll show you how to become a Maximum Lawyer in Minimum Time. Find out more by going to MaximumLawyer.com forward slash course. We're talking to Tom Case today. He's a civil rights and other kind of lawyer up in Chicago. And we're glad we now have someone to refer our prisoner cases to. Please. Our our civil rights cases to. Tom, what do you like the most about running your law firm? And if you were to give away some of your responsibilities, I know you like the tech stuff, but if you were to give away some of your responsibilities, what would you give away and what would you keep? I like the investigatory stuff when I have time to do it. So, you know, for example, you know, I got a prisoner's rights case out of Louisiana, and it's, it's the one I kind of was was not really joking about when I gave that example to Tyson. My guy got in a short scuffle with another guard in a housing unit that he got handcuffed, and then he got frog marched to a dark corner, and they beat the shit out of him bad. And you know, they say, no, we didn't, we didn't touch him. All the scars on his face in the medical assessment video that was taken after the beating. You know, the fact, the fact that he looks like hamburger, all that happened in the third, you know, 10 second scuffle on the housing unit. And, you know, what I've been trying to do is find the 60 other inmates that were in the housing unit and saw exactly what happened, who can testify that when this guy walked out of the housing unit, he was fine. Where I'm actually deposing one of them in about an hour and a half. And I love kind of digging in the records and doing the kind of guerrilla discovery. It's, it's also a big part of the sexual harassment and housing cases. You find out. You know, usually you can find 25 other women who've been harassed in exact, exactly the same way by the by the guy. And I really enjoy that stuff. And I don't get to do enough of it, given the other demands. What I would give away, I think, man, I wish I could give away certain opposing counsel. I can't do that. But there are some folks who just just drive me nuts. And, you know, in, in, it's always discovery, right? It's always like. I've asked you for something completely reasonable and you give me some boilerplate objection that doesn't hack it in federal court. And then I got to chase you in front of it, an indifferent judge who's going to let you, you know, let you off the hook. And that part of the practice is just exhausting, but it's, you know, but it's also so, so important because, you know, nowadays, like the discovery request is just foreplay. Like if you don't actually go and get the motion to compel order, you're not getting anything. So, you know, it's so, so, so important, but man, is it, is it exhausting? Tom, how old are you right now? Damn. I didn't know you were going to ask tough questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, what do I, I think I turned 38 this year. Okay. So, we're the same. Days, so in 22 years, when you're 60, what's your firm look like? I would like to have, you know, four or five or maybe six kind of niche practice areas. So I think not, not prisoners' rights writ large, but like I want to do failure to protect cases where the injuries are. X, Y, or, you know, excessive force cases like this. And I think that that's actually another way to kind of manage tough cases is you just pick the well-worn path and you focus on those. So I'd like to have a, a few of those because I think, you know, look, Congress could repeal 1983 any day and, you know, the world can change, right? So I don't want to be hyper-focused in, in one or a, a group of related things. I'd like to have a little bit of diversification. I'd like to have, you know, a good team of of people who kind of want to have their lives and really want to do this work and who value that that balance like I do. I would like to have everything that can be done automatically being done automatically. You know, I really, I really, you know, I think it's something I learned from you guys on your show, but I, you know, I really do right now things that I think can be automated or templatized or, or turned into a process that I can outsource to, you know, somebody in, in Latvia for, you know, six bucks an hour and to them it's 30 bucks an hour. I really want to get there because I think you just save so much time and create so much value by kind of leveraging those, you know, those wage, wage rates and, and virtual assistants and that, you know, I'd like to be able to 
do exactly how much law I want to do and, and no more. Like I'd love to be running the firm. And if I want to have one or two cases where I'm the lead lawyer, great. But if I don't, great. You know, I'd just like to have that, that flexibility. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like the firm to have a reputation as a place people can come to kind of have a decent life, do all right in the wallet, and really learn a system for practicing plaintiff side law that, you know, they could take with them if they want to leave. I suspect that we have a lot of listeners who have a civil rights case over in the corner that they haven't looked at in a while. And they're, and they probably got some federal judge with some harsh deadlines and all that stuff. What do you say to the people that think they can dabble in this kind of work that you're doing? You know, every one of these cases that, that winds up with a lawyer rather than just pro se, I think is a good thing. Cause I do think that, you know, in a lot of the federal district courts, if you're pro se, you're not really getting a judge, you're getting a pro se law clerk. And, you know, much, much like judges, some of the pro se law clerks are wonderful. Some of them are, are always looking for a way to, to, to dump your case. So I think every one of these cases that gets a lawyer, it, it increases the chances it's, it's going to get a real look. And I think you, you can always be helpful. And I, I would encourage people to dabble, but I'd encourage the people who are really dabbling, you know, there are great resources like the Ninth Circuit has kind of a law outline for 1983. I think the Northern District of Illinois has a handbook for prisoners' civil rights cases. You know, you're wherever you're practicing, they likely have, you know, some resource for lawyers trying these cases because, you know, like a lot of times it's somebody who's appointed who's never done it before. So a lot of the courts really try to help make good use of those things because they will really help you out. Because although the law is complicated, a lot of the legal issues in these cases are, if not settled, at least, you know, people, you know, people know exactly where the, the pressure points are. So there's a lot, there's a lot of really good free resources out there that, that people should use. And, you know, I, I'd say for the folks who probably have a few of them in the corner, you know, if one of the best things I think they can do is bring a, a PI's lawyer, a, a good PI lawyer's attitude towards proving up a damages case to these cases, because that's kind of the one place where I think the the really good civil rights bar is not as good as the really good catastrophic injury, wrongful death kind of PI bar is, you know, showing, proving, focusing on the value of especially non-economic losses. And, you know, you see a lot of, the, you know, you see a lot of trials in these cases where just like the conduct is horrific. Like, you know, intentionally framing someone for a murder, you know, they didn't commit horrific. And, you know, people spend 10 years in a, in a hellhole of a prison for something they didn't do. And then you get, you know, you get damage awards that like, you know, if you had a kind of David Ball approach or if you had like a Nick Rowley doing it, you know, you get a billion dollars. But a lot of my civil rights lawyer colleagues, you know, were so focused on like all the kind of chintzy constitutional law qualified immunity nonsense that, Sometimes I think we don't focus enough on, you know, proving up the human story so that we can we can score some big numbers at trial. Sounds like a fantastic opportunity for you, Tom. So let's well, that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm hoping, man. Like I'm hoping that I can get over the reluctance of people to, to pay for these cases. Because, you know, I'll tell you already, every every time I drop a demand in one of these, people just look at me like I'm from Mars. And I'm like, you know what? That's cause that's cause what you know. Jury don't know what you know. Like Jury's going to know what we tell them. So, you know, you want to roll the dice, let's roll the dice. I like that. I like that ego too. That's that, they got me pumped up a little bit. All right. We do need to wrap things up before I do. I want to remind everyone about the conference. Okay. Conference is coming up in October. It's 11th, 12th, and 13th of October. The 11th is the guild day. Okay. The 12th and 13th of the conference. And we are going to sell out. So I'm going to tell you, go get your tickets because uh, you're going to run out of time. So get your tickets now because you, we will sell out maxlawcon.com. Get your tickets and also join us in the guild. If you want, if you're interested in the guild, maxlawguild.com. And then also if, you, if you're not ready for either of those, go to the big group on Facebook, get involved there. There's a lot of great activity every single day. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? So I'm always in this struggle with my phone and the distraction machine that it is. And one of the things that I've done recently is I redid my home screen. So the first screen with the, you know, I, I had lots of folders and things and I found like to get to Filevine, I had to go through like six buttons. So I said, forget all that. I'm going to move the crap that I never use off the home screen. And so in doing so, 
I also decided, I read it somewhere, to put all my social media on the farthest screen. So now when I pick up my phone, I have like my Kindle and stuff that I want to spend my time on and the stuff that I don't need to be wasting time on. I put away at the back on the back screen. And just that has made me more mindful of the time that I've spent on social media. Well, let me, let me give you a tip on top of a hack. Ready for this? I think this is our first time ever. This is exclusive. Wow. Put it in a folder, move it, move it to the far yeah, screen and put it into a folder. So boom, yeah. that, now you have an extra layer. Yep. Uh, I don't have any of my social media apps outside of, out of, uh, out of a folder. Cause it just, it's just distracting and get rid of all the damn bubbles, go into your settings, change it. So you don't have all those little bubbles. So you're not reminded of it. That's a good one, Jimmy. All right, Tom, you know, the routine, what is your tip or hack of the week? Sure. So I was thinking a lot about what's kind of the one thing that I learned that, that might help people. And, you know, especially in, in building the systems at Keller, what was driven home to me is if you try to build it hundred percent, right, exactly how you need it before you, before you start doing the thing. So you want to, you know, you want to build a system for PI cases and, you know, and you go and you try to build out Filevine 100% of the way, all the way, do all your temp, you know, do it all. You're going to get 85% of it wrong. And the only, the only way to build systems is incrementally. And, you know, you, you just, just do it once, even if it's inefficient, you know, do each step once, inefficient, learn about the step. Then after you've learned about it, then you figure out how to automate it what the process should be and you just gradually build from there you know it's that kind of gradual incremental glomming on of step one process and then step two and then step three you know when we when we did that we succeeded when we tried to be like oh no we gotta wait six months to try to build out salesforce on this and that you know we just wasted oodles of time and money because by that you know by the time you're done with that you've learned that what you thought you needed isn't what you needed so just don't don't sweat it. Just start building and, and doing, and you'll you'll get there. I love that. I, I saw that in the form that you filled out, and it was, it was one of the things I wanted to get to. We just didn't have time, so I'm glad you brought it up because I, I thought it was a great great little line that you had in there. So that, yeah. that's perfect. Lots of lots of pain and blood behind that learning. <laughs> For sure, I think we've all been there. So, all right. So my tip of the week is if you need a text function um, for your firm. Uh, or you can even do it with a phone call function. Some that we had something that was a little bit a uh, use case outside of what we use Fileline for, because Fileline's got text messaging built into it. It's fantastic. I love it. We had a, a different use case for it, and we looked into and we adopted Twilio. Twilio. I'm not sure if it's been recommended on the podcast before, but we've been using it over the last week or two. And it's really good. And there's no lag. A lot of these services, whenever you've got text messaging, there is a lag. And with this, it's not, it's instantaneous. And so whenever we, we've got a certain lead form that we fill out, once it's uh, filled out, text messages go out and it's really great. We, we love it. So I highly recommend Twilio. Jim, you're shaking your head. Were you shaking your head at Twilio? I'm curious. I love Twilio. I'm shaking my head because you're on this phase now where you're working with Kelsey and you're throwing out all these things that I've been doing for years as if they're that's brand funny. Well, it's funny because that. he and I were, were sort of working together and then coming together and then um, showing our work. And then uh, we're not working actual together. It's like more like sharing the work kind of a thing. It's interesting. So he didn't even bring that up to me. I just kind of came to that to my own. I had no idea that you were using Twilio, but we really haven't had a use. Uh, we haven't had a need for it until recently. The way we are, because we, the way we use Fava and it, you've got the text messaging built in, but um, we're using Twilio to, to add in some additional functionality. So it's pretty cool. So, all right, Tom, thanks so much for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Like Jim said, this was a really easy interview because you're a great talker, which is fantastic. So that's awesome. But thank you so much. Hopefully, a lot of people learned uh, a lot of what uh, from, from what you had to say. So thank you so much. No, thank you guys. This is a this is a great resource for everybody. I appreciate you guys doing it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Take care. You too. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your hosts and to access more content, content. go to maximumlawyer.com. Maximumlawyer.com. Have a great week and catch you next time.